Okay? Now, you see, the global reality today is that 3%, 240 million, or one out of 33 person on planet Earth today do not live in the country where they were born. And if you realize this, it actually has got a tremendous implications on how we view life and ministry. And you know, while I was doing my, uh, I, I, I read literally thousands of pages on migration, and I also began to read what the scriptures talk about migration, and I was really taken up by the fact that migration actually had always been one of God's sovereign means to accomplish His purposes. Okay? Now, of course, you, uh, you, don't, you don't find the word migrant in the Bible, but in the Bible, they use another word. How many of you know what that is? Sojourner, alien, and stranger. Next time when you, the next time round when you read through your Bible, I want you to go look through and look out for this word, alien and stranger. And the reality is this. In everything that God has done in the Old Testament until the New Testament, it was actually through migrants. Number one, Abraham was a migrant when God called him out to leave his family, to leave his home in Ur, and to move across the Fertile Crescent, to move to Canaan land. And it was when he was moving out, God, uh, that was when God really dealt with him. God dealt with him, asking him to move out. And the further revelation came as when he was moving out uh, into the, uh, the desert and onto Canaan land. And then, move a little bit further. Israel forged, Israel became a nation, developed an identity as God's people through the years of suffering where? As migrants in Egypt. And even while they were wandering through uh, the, the desert of Sinai, okay, it was in that entire period, through their migrant experience, they developed the identity as a people of God. Let's move on a bit further. All the time when you read through the book of Judges and until the time of King, so uh, King David, Solomon, you realize that the Jews were falling again and again and again into idolatry. But did you know when did the Jewish people break free from idolatry? When they were migrants, when they were taken off uh, in the time of uh, Jeremiah, when they were removed from their homeland and they were forced into captivity in Babylon. And that was where the yoke of idolatry was broken over the Jewish people as a migrant people. Okay? And what about Jesus himself? Was he a migrant? Think about it. He was not born in his hometown. And even for some years, he actually had a time in, the, in Egypt. And now let's move on to the book of Acts. How did the church of Jesus Christ grow? Through migrants. In the book of Acts, chapter 8, the persecution, uh, persecution broke out in Jerusalem. And what happened was this. Uh, people were not sent out as missionaries. They were forced out as missionaries. <laughs> but they didn't have the title as missionary. They were basically ordinary people, business people, that end up being scattered all over the world, all over the entire Mediterranean world. And the gospel was preached because of persecution and where they went as business people, where they settled, they shared the gospel. And really, when you begin to look at the whole thing, and you know, as I was beginning to survey the entire of what Scripture says, I realized this more and more that it is really true migration. Now, I'm not going to go into church history, but when you go to church history again and again, you find that through the movements of people, the gospel actually gets spread. And many of these movements are not voluntary. They are actually forced. And even right now, you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking of Iraq. All of you, all of you guys know what's, what's, what's been happening, whether through Facebook or the, or the media. You know that entire movements of people are just simply being forced out of their homes. But have you ever thought of it? That somehow there can be a redemptive value. Now, I'm a missiologist, so I study, uh, I do research about church growth movements. And uh, people may not realize it, but one of the fastest growing church movements right now, church group movements, is among the Iranians. I don't know whether there's any Iranian here. But uh, it, has been, it has exploded after the Ayatollah came into power 
and the Iranians were forced into the diaspora. And what happened was, wherever they were migrants, somehow God sovereignly moved. And uh, when, when they received the gospel, they begin to bring the gospel back into Iran. And because of that, right now, uh, you're talking about 20 years ago, the number of Christians converts huh? uh, from, a, from a non-Christian background is probably about 100,000. Right now, they don't know. Uh, conservatively, it's about 500,000, but some, pe- some estimates has gone up to 1 to 2 million. Okay? It, it is huge. It is, it is big. And a lot of it, we are saying, is simply because there are certain things that happen in migration where God works and somehow people are open uh, to the gospel. So, now, let me very quickly just go into the, uh, my material. Okay? So, if... This whole migration experience thing and identity is so important. Then there is some principle for us. That is, Christians that we need to know that we are called to nurture a, an alien or a migrant identity. Now, I'm going to very quickly go with you because uh, this is not a foreign idea. It is found, first of all, in the New Testament because 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, it tells us so clearly that as obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all that you do. For it is written, uh, uh, for it's written be holy because I'm holy. And since you call on a father who judges each man's work impartially, live your lives as strangers here in reverent fear. Okay? So it says this, live your life, recognize not just that you are a migrant in Malaysia, but recognize that you are a migrant on planet Earth, that your life of 60 and 70 years, or I'm asking God, 80 years, 85 years, recognize that it is not permanent, but you are just simply passing through. And just now we collected our tithes and offering. Now, do you realize that this is also found in the Old Testament? Uh, let, me, uh, let me give it to you specifically, Deuteronomy chapter 26 where it gives instruction about offering and tithe. Where when they come to the priest, now of course during those days they don't use offering bags. I'm sure you're aware of that, huh? They don't bring offering bags, they bring whatever they have. It says this, The priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. And then it says this, Then you shall declare before the Lord your God. You speak it out and you say, My father was a wandering Aramean. Now, what in the world does this have to do with anything? You see, this text was given by the Lord to future generations of Israelites who were already subtle, who had prospered, who have built nice homes, who have nice vineyards and everything else, who have never undergone the trauma or have that migration experience. And God is saying to them is that every time you come before me and when you give your offering, I want you to remember your roots. And that's why you say, I was, my father was a wandering Aramean. And he went down into Egypt with a few people and he lived there and he became a great nation, powerful and numerous. It is, in other words, recognize that we are pilgrims on this earth. It is God who has prospered us. It is God who took us from where we were and God who has taken us to where we are right now. And then in verse 11, I'm just going to jump to verse 11. And you and the Levites and the aliens among you shall rejoice in all the the good things the Lord your God has given to you and your household. I don't know, guys. Have you, when you read through this, I, I know you guys read the Bible, I assume. Okay? But when you come, when you come to these passages, have you thought of it that way? Why in the world it was there? It is simply the reminder, Old Testament, New Testament, remember your roots. And God is saying this, remind yourself that I am a migrant before the Lord. And when we begin to recognize it, you realize that it changes the way that you think. And right now, let me just very quickly today, your pastor talked about four reasons to to go for camp. Let me give you four impacts that the migrant experience have on our life, okay? First of all, our migrant experiences are actually appointments to encounter God in a fresh new way. Because 
when you are taken away from your home, when, you're, when you are away from what is familiar, from friends, you know, sometimes it can be a very traumatic experience, okay? When you're away from home for the first time. Now, I've traveled quite a bit, but when I first went to US in 2012, and I was there for 11 months. Now, come on, I'm not, I'm not a young kid. But even then, being 11 months being away from home, you kind of feel, yeah, you said it, uh, homesick. I mean, I still, I still got to go and I was telling my wife, I don't look forward to being away for too long. I mean, regardless, nowadays you've got Skype and everything else, okay? But you just imagine, those days, they don't have that. But yet, it is when th in those times that you kind of feel that you don't have anybody. That is when God began to meet with you in a fresh new way. Now you think about it. Was Daniel a migrant? 17 years old. He wasn't a voluntary migrant. I was a voluntary migrant. He was forced. He was taken as a captive into Babylon. But yet that was where he encountered God. God encountered him. And from there, you have those revelations. And today we are still reading the book of Daniel. And uh, for those Africans in our midst, let me show you something. This is Sunday. His name is Sunday, by the way. <laughs> okay? This Reverend Sunday Adelaide is possibly pastoring right now the largest church in East Europe. We're probably something like 25 to 26 to 30,000. Now, how did they end up there? Is that he became a Christian at the age of 19, and within six months, he had a scholarship to do, to do uh, journalism in the former Soviet Union. And he never knew uh, too much about communism during those days. And what happened was this. As a young man, he went there. He never knew of what an atheistic country can be like. And could you imagine, just to remind himself of home, he would hang up a cross on his dormitory bed, you know, just beside the bed, and he was persecuted by the staff and the faculty. They came after him. You see? And, but, that, but yet, in the midst of that experience, that was where he really began to encounter God and God revealed himself to him. You know, I've been reading to the internet and he was telling stories about how he, would, uh, he wasn't allowed to pray. He couldn't find church on Sunday. And he actually would cover himself with a blanket so he could pray without people knowing that he was praying. But yet, in that midst of a very godless place, not only did he encounter God, but as he encountered God, he experienced God, and he began to understand the power of God and the love of God, and he started to reach out to people. Okay? And today, he is leading one of the, possibly the largest church in Eastern Europe. And when you look at it, it's kind of weird, you know? One black guy <laughs> with all the white guys there. <laughs> okay? That's what it is. But yet, that is what the migrant experience is all about. And if you are going through a migrant experience today where you are away from a situation where you feel strange, where you feel unfamiliar, where you feel that there's nobody that really, really uh, is able to empathize with you, understand you, and be there for you. Think about it that those are, those are times that God is using just to touch you and speak to you and reveal Himself to you in a way that would have been impossible if you're surrounded by friends. Okay, think about it. Now, number two, our migrant experience is also opportunities to serve God in fresh new ways. For example,